episode are we on? 31. My God. 31. This is incredible. Do you know why this is incredible? Why is this because incredible? when I when I see the number thirty one, I think of Halloween. Don't you? Yes, that's true. That's I just I think of Halloween. I don't know why I think of that. It's it's odd. And I thought for a moment I had bypassed the summer because I hate the summer. I hate the heat. I hate all of it. I love the cool, cold, crisp smell oh, in the air. God. And this last two weeks of my life, I mean, we oh. weren't here last week. We were, we were both very, very busy the last yeah. couple of weeks. Uh, I've been doing two tours a day for about 12 days straight, <gasps> and it's been crazy. Today oh. is literally first day I've had off, and I've got things, the to-do list around the house is piling mm-hmm. up. I mean, I'd like to sit and stare at a spot on the wall. I mean, it's just it's just been crazy. Um, tours have been great. I'm so glad for the business. Right. I really, sure. really am. Mm-hmm. But uh, I just wish there was a way I could do it, like three door, three days for tours, take yeah. a day off. Two days, a day off. Three. I, you, they come in when they come in. You just never, ever, ever know when they're going to come in. Right. And it's 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 exhausting. I mean, I don't know how people do it with real jobs. Like Sue. Sure. But. She works 12 hours a day. She is so understaffed at her at her store. I don't understand how she does it. Right. And she's got to deal with corporate America. She's got to deal with uh, people um, in the in the public. You know, the public can be very rude and abrasive. Oh, but she, she's got to deal with that understaffing running around like a, a chicken with its head cut off. I mean, it's mm. crazy. Yeah. And so I try. I'll complain here. I'll try not to complain too much because <laughs> she's like, OK. You drive around dressing like Rocky, talking about Rocky and Rocky land. <laughs> Your job is amazing. She goes, it ain't bad, pal. You don't get to complain. <laughs> you don't get to complain. No, I don't. And I try really, really hard, really hard to yeah. not complain, you know. But yeah. every once in a while, she does give me the okay. She's yeah. like, no, she goes, I, I get it. You know, there are certain things. I mean, because it's all relative, Stacy. Sure. Right? It's yeah. all relative, you know. It, it, it Like. For you, for example, you were out of town for a little bit. What what have you been up to? Yeah. Well, I mean, as I was going to say, I mean, even though you're doing all that, it's still hard work. It's still tiring. And I'm sure, yeah. You know, and you've left me messages just being stuck in traffic and you're ready to pull your hair out. Oh, yeah. That that is, that's annoying. But um, yeah, no, Tennessee was great. It's beautiful. Uh, Nashville, of course. My daughter's down there at school. So always so nice to see her. Uh, But, you know, we did our house shopping and it's, it went, great and the i guess what we got out of the trip the most is that we drove everywhere from oh, wow. from nashville to south of knoxville all around chattanooga nashville's getting bogged down really really fast because there's like this migration of people moving south yeah yeah, yeah. and and i'm just the opposite of you on weather i hate the winter i can't right see yeah we talked five about this yeah months of gray skies i'm done i gotta yeah. get out of here i um, get it i get and it and so i'm trying to get down there for the weather and um and of course you know <laughs> the happy accident is to be by sarah so that'd be good but of course now after in two years that i've been traveling since she's been in college the traffic around nashville is horrendous oh, suddenly wow. it's horrible suddenly and so kevin and i are like uh is this really the area we want to move maybe we should consider chattanooga or around knoxville so we took the time to go look at all those um you know uh communities and some are just far enough and some are too remote and there's nothing but cows horses and a dollar general um Uh, and they're beautiful out there but i just i don't want to have to travel 30 minutes to go food shopping you know oh Um, i understand that and we saw a few houses but there's a we're we're outbid you know people are yeah. showing up with 100 percent cash so it's right. it's tough it's tough so uh, my takeaway this trip is we learn the communities we want to be in and so we'll continue house shopping we will get I there gotcha. but it's just it's tough right now it's definitely a tough market right now so i got you i got you yeah well i'll tell you what we got a guest this week who oh knows God. a thing or two about being tough he really does yeah. uh he's a guy he's a friend of mine we wanted to have him on for a, a, a real long time. And during the interview, we explained why it, I was hesitant. Mm-hmm. Um, Derek Wayne Johnson uh, is a filmmaker. He's a writer. He was an actor for a little while. And I wrote down on my little cue card here, I wrote down some of the documentaries because I didn't want to get the names wrong. Sometimes I miss a word. And, and his his documentaries are, are so good. I don't want to 
uh, miss a word. King of the underdogs about John Avildsen and uh, who was his mentor and and really filmmaking idol. It was his Spielberg, yeah. really. Yeah. Uh, 40 years of Rocky. This poster right here. He worked yeah. with Sly on that to make bring that to light. It's a half hour documentary. And uh, you can see these on Amazon uh, uh, Prime as well. He did Stallone Frank, that is which is a very interesting documentary about Sly, uh, about the Stallone family, uh, specifically Frank and uh, Frank's highs and lows and mm -hmm. in-betweens. And it's uh, mm -hmm. quite fascinating. And you get to see a side of Frank Stallone. I think a lot of people will be surprised that. So mm -hmm. check that out. And the big thing, imagine this. Sly calls him up and asks him to edit the documentary of the making of the re-edit <laughs> right. of Rocky Four this past November. Yeah. And Derek did an amazing job. It's actually on YouTube for mm -hmm. free. You can go watch it on YouTube, yeah. this documentary. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, with that, Stacy, let's just pick up in the middle of the, the interview where we started, the, the opening sentence. How about it? All right. I'll go get him. I'll be right back. Right. <laughs> Derek. Derek, I, I can happily say that you are one of the, when it comes to beards and <laughs> facial, the only one above you is Chuck Norris. It is you <laughs> and Chuck Norris. You wear that so well. I've been growing scruff now. This is about six months. I got nothing. Wow. <laughs> how long does it take you to grow that? Well, this is just because I haven't shaved in I don't know how long. But you have more hair on the top of your head than I do. So <laughs> it evens out. You know? It evens out. Yeah, you got to see my back. I don't yeah, know what happens when we get older. The hair just starts growing. I'm like, like Br Brundle Fly. Man, what was that with Jeff Goldblum? Right? Uh, the yeah, the just, fly, yeah, yeah. It's disgusting. Yeah. I don't know what happens. You Tell know you what? Take the Rocky Four fake beard. Right, and right, right. And you're good. You're good. I'm good. I'm good. You know, you know, Derek, that, that is so funny that you said that. I just enlightened someone on the tour just a few days ago, and they were, uh, they had said, oh, man, you know, Stallone was so smart to grow that beard going out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I said, well, not exactly. And I had gone through this scenario, and they were like, they were crushed that he didn't grow a beard. I said, no, no, Sly said, he says, I couldn't, it was coming in patchy. It just wouldn't come in. So we yeah. had no beard. <laughs> well, so, well, I want to say real quick, sorry about uh, the audio problem a second ago, um, but Stacy, it's nice to meet you. We have Nice to meet you too. Met. And Mike, just seeing your background, it just warms the heart. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Brother, you know I love all you do. I I do. I have this is not I didn't just get these on eBay or you know, I I've had these for years, okay? So uh it, it means a lot and they are prized possessions I have here in my Rocky room. I did bring them in so I could have them up front for this, but normally <laughs> they're on the wall. So uh and I do have your signature and I and and um uh, oddly enough I have John's signature, uh John G. Alvinson's uh on um on the King of Underdogs poster, which I love. And and I have cue the Rocky music right ah. back on the bookshelf. <laughs> just so you know, it's there. See that? <laughs> See that? That's amazing. And then we and even uh, John's uh painting right there. So. Oh, and Nibbly's painting, yeah. right? Yeah. Isn't that brilliant? I mean it's always hidden in podcasts when I'm on this angle. So John, just so you know, if you're listening, it's there. <laughs> or, exactly. There. And, and for those of you wondering who John is, John Rivley, Icons and Art, he is the official Rocky artist for MGM, but he's also the greatest artist for MGM uh, when it comes to Rocky. I mean, this guy is brilliant. So you guys know all about him. Go look him up. Derek, it is so awesome to have you here because I can, Stacy and I consider you an expert in the field of Rockyism. I mean, you could probably teach a college class. Uh, on on Rocky. I mean, you've you've gotten so much FaceTime in with creators of the series. And the reason, let me just let me just mention to people what what you've done, uh, Rocky related. So you did a little documentary called King of the Underdogs. You did one called 40 Years of Rocky. You've got Stallone, Frank that is. And you also were asked by Sly to edit the Rocky 4 documentary. Derek, I mean, 
what a list in the Rocky world to be a part of. When you think about that, how does that make you feel? Uh, you know, sometimes I'm still pinching myself. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, then, you know, I tell you what, a bullet point to teaching a class. You could write the book. I'll <laughs> teach it. I'll teach the class from the book with, with all that. that you know. But um, and, and Stacy, I'm sure you as well. Just you guys know a lot of stuff. I think I come from it more of the filmmaking aspect yeah, of it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it feels it feels really cool. It you know it, it all started with you know my relationship with John Avildsen, and and then from there snowballed into Sly, and and here we are today. So. I never knew when I set out to make King of the Underdogs that it would like yeah. all these other documentaries would come from it, which I just can't believe. I mean, it's, it's just truly, and it, it, what's really cool is getting to meet all of you guys in this Rocky world mm -hmm. and watching you all, you know, how you respond to my films. And it's in a way, it's almost like, I hope this comes off the right way. It's, it's, it's like, I get to, put on screen a lot of things that you guys have been thinking or wanting. Right. And able to do that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And right. I'm very thankful for that um, and, and grateful. And, and just the fan base has been really uh, supportive of, of my films. And of course, Sylvester just being like, Hey, let's do this one. Let's do that one. I'm like, Whoa. <laughs> Big deal. Right? You know, and that, we're definitely going to be talking uh, more about that as, as we go along. But I, I, one of the things I wanted to talk about, a funny thing happened a week or two ago. Um, one of our uh, co-host fill-ins, uh, Tony C., he had reached out to you. And not that I didn't want him to reach out to you. It's just I, people have asked. Stacy has had numerous requests. Yeah. Just, Why don't we get Derek on? And I go, nah. Eh. He's doing his thing. Let him do his thing. And she was like, wait, you guys have issues? I said, no, I love the guy. I said, he's just doing his thing. And I never really shared right. kind of what I knew through conversations with you. And it turns out, on one hand, it's a blessing to be somewhat of a Rocky Karate Kid Stallone documentarian. But mm -hmm. it can also be a bit of a pigeonhole curse. Would you, would you just tell us a little bit about that? And, and, and how it's affected you because I didn't want to bring you back into the Rocky universe because I knew on the surface you were trying to break out of that mold and I didn't want to drag you back in. I wanted you to be our first guest on the podcast. Right. <laughs> tell, well, us, tell us how it's helped and hurt. Thank you for that. And, and for the audience, if you don't know, Mike and I are really close. We've been friends for probably eight years at least, but we didn't meet yeah. until about three years ago right. in person. So, we do share a lot of um, communications in that sense. And so what basically what Mike is saying is, yeah, as a filmmaker, see, I'm talking to the Rocky fans right now, okay, mm -hmm. as a whole. So, because this is the Rocky Fox. So as a filmmaker, I'm a huge Rocky fan, obviously. Mm -hmm. but, but to what Mike, you're saying is, I also have to pay bills and I also have to make other films. So what happened was is, John Avildsen is, was, you know, a friend of mine and my mentor, my directing influence. So I made a documentary on him and again, Sly and et cetera, started giving me more work in that realm, which I'm completely grateful for. And like blows my mind. <laughs> what also happens is if I want to go make a feature film or, a, a horror film or something that's not Rocky Stallone, Karate Kid, Avildsen related. It started becoming to where I was almost pigeonholed as a Rocky Karate Kid, Stallone, Avildsen documentarian. Mm -hmm. Even the word documentarian was starting to become a, a problem for me because I actually had, I won't say his name, but a very, very big Hollywood producer that we all know his films was kind of uh courting me to to direct the feature and he goes he literally says to me he goes how do i know that you're not just you know a rocky documentarian and it that was a moment where it was like oh no because there is more to me as there was more to john Allison and sylvester stallone you yeah. have to branch out and do other things so it's been difficult because you don't want to upset the fans 
but at the same time, I can't just keep doing those types of films. Now, sure. obviously, guys, Sly was like, I want you to direct a Rocky movie or a Creed movie or, you know, Zapka and Macho are like, hey, come do Cobra Kai episode. Of course. Are you kidding me? Yeah. You better. Exactly. Like, <laughs> I'm taking absolutely. away your Rocky card if you don't, okay? <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Right, right, well, it's been a struggle because I love Rocky and Karate Kid so much, just the whole Abelson Stallone world, but I have to protect my brand. And, sure. and I have so much more to offer, but I'm still inspired by mm-hmm. that legacy. And I'm very humbled and honored and truly grateful for these opportunities. I will never yeah. turn fly down and rest in peace, John Abelson. But and I'll never turn Karate Kid down. But th- there it is. There's my spiel to the fan. I love base. it. I, and even like Mike, you and I have talked about it. Sometimes I have to like I'm inundated with Rocky. Mm-hmm. As I'm like editing a Rocky, you know, for example, I edited the Rocky four doc for like five months. Yeah. And I couldn't talk about it. And like, I'm seeing the social media, I'm seeing all the things. And I'm just, it's just like hitting me in the face. And then what I did was from there, when I finished editing that, I went and shot a feature film that's not out yet. Yeah. And it was like a palate cleanser. And, uh, and, and Sly actually watched it the other day. He liked it. So I sent him a link and he was very, uh, had a lot of nice words. So there's my whole story. There it is. I'll wrap it up with that, that I love you guys. I love Rocky, but I also have to do other things. Of course. Of course. This, I want to piggyback this because this is a problem I have found in my own life. Uh, I can't do anything well if I'm not passionate about it Mm -hmm. and I'm forget family. Family doesn't count in this scenario this is a work scenario okay so the only thing i'm passionate about is rocky so if i can't do anything rocky related i'll be homeless that's what i'm trying to say (laughs) how do you get up for how do you choose a movie you're also a writer and an actor and you're as a matter of fact stacy would you do me a favor this (laughs) is a wonderful segue i'd like to play a little something from derek from way back in the day and i want to get derek's thoughts on it please hit that uh b-roll for us hang on Hey, that's when Dan should already be to Peebo. So I, I'm coming around. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do that part only. Uh, all right, cool. Let's do this. So MJ dies, and I'm watching TV, and I'm watching all the news coverage. And Stone Phillips, the news reporter, was uh, was reporting Michael Jackson's death. And I was like, Stone, it's a cool name. You know, it's a manly name. I like that. It'd be cool for a, for a movie character. And then I remember sitting there, and I was like, Stone. Stone DeBrock. Like Stone DeBrock, that sounds cool. So I named, in that first five minutes, I named this script that wasn't even written, you know, this idea Stone DeBrock. It was interesting because, like I said, as an actor, I love to play um, kind of, you know, neat little characters. So I thought of the balance. Let me play this, uh, this, this hero. Let me play this, this off-the-wall character, and they're twins. I look at props or what's around me. What's in my bedroom? What's in my little box that I can open up and, and, and play with? You know, because basically when you're making a movie, you're just playing, you know, what, what interests me as a kid. The making of broken blood. I came across <laughs> this documentary a while back. I haven't said anything to you about it because I knew eventually we get you on. I want to surprise you a little bit with this. I, lo- I haven't seen broken blood yet. I'm going to. I love the documentary because it shows us what you do. It gave you insight into how you see things. And Derek, I loved how you said we're playing in a movie. What can I play with to make it more engaging? I love that. Take us through this movie and this documentary. Wow. Well, first of all, <laughs> uh, I think I'm like beat red right now from seeing that. Um, and who was that it. guy? Who was that 27-year-old with no beard? Um, I love it. I, I'm a former actor. I want to state that. I haven't acted since that film, actually. I started out, I thought I was Orson Welles, right? thought I was going to make the next Citizen Kane and be this big actor and filmmaker. I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I, I enjoyed acting, but I, I gave it up. So in that particular film, <laughs> wow, I can't believe that's mind-blowing. Um, I did act in it. I played two characters. So anyway, uh, that was um, my third feature film and I've done five, I believe 
And so, yeah, you get a little insight. And I think on YouTube, that's called the making of broken blood. Mm-hmm. And you really get to see uh, what it's like to make a feature film. And, uh, you know, again, I was 27 at the time. And that really, th- that film did a lot for me. It was a stepping stone. And, mm-hmm. you know, you take the, uh, you take the lessons you've learned, you know, and, and you put them into that film, you go off to Hollywood, like I did, you become, you know, you get mentored by Sly and John Avildsen, and, and then you take all of those new lessons and those new tools right. and you put them into your next film, which is what I've done with my upcoming feature called Bloodstreams. Mm-hmm. And, so when I look at those old films that I used to do, I see the, the ambition. I see the drive that a lot of the Rocky spirit is in that 27 year old that you're seeing. Yeah. Oh, Sly did it at 30. I'm 27. Let me do it. Of course, you know, never to his success, but it, it takes that kind of ambition and that kind of drive and to, to get out and go make those films. So, yeah, yeah man, I, I can't believe you guys found that. And- <laughs> what is it about? See, at the, and the thing I'm bringing this all back into is passion and fire and what motivates you, what moves you to do it, to get up out of the morning. Because it isn't money. Money doesn't motivate me to go do Rocky tours and and, and, and do this podcast. That's not it. you got to have that fire, and it's never shut off since I saw Rocky in 1979. What is it for you? How do you choose a, a, a project? Do you write it? Do you go with a friend and write it? Like, how, Or do you? will you take it for a paycheck? And there's nothing wrong with that either. All of the above. All of the mm-hmm. above. Usually I like to create because I'm, you know, I'm a director, writer, producer, editor. So all of that. So yeah. usually I like to create something either that I've written or I have a co-writer. We, uh, Frank Mangarelli, we work together. We wrote Bloodstreams together and he just sees eye to eye with me, right? So I like to create with the documentaries, you know, I came up with the idea to, to do the Avildsen documentary. It wasn't my idea to do Frank Stallone documentary. It was one of my producing partners, but the light bulb went off. I knew it was a good idea. Right. 40 Years of Rocky was Sly's idea. Uh, Bloodstreams was my idea. So was Broken Blood, et cetera. So you never know. Obviously, if I got an offer, like Sly offered me to edit uh, Keep Punching, The Making of Rocky vs. Drago. Of course. So it all kind of... Now, I've turned down a gazillion projects. Okay. I've been fired from a few. I've been rejected for several. So you just have to... If you believe in the story, if you believe in it, do it. If you don't believe in it, but the paycheck is nice, hey, man, we all have bills to pay. It yeah. just depends. But exactly. what you saw in that was that hungry pre John Avildsen mentorship. I had not right. met him yet. I was hungry and I went and made a movie. And um, yeah, the rest is history. You know, we've had several, <laughs> numerous conversations of how uh, Rocky has affected people's lives. You're growing up and you're from Texas, right? Right. Yeah. Is it Carthage? Yeah. Yeah. Car- yeah, I thought it was. Um, you're watching Rocky as a kid. You're watching the Karate Kid as a kid. What? How did that affect your life? At, and how old were you? Oh man, it's, this just reminds me of Mike when we met in person for the first time. We were yeah. so jazzed and talked. We about were, it. man. We yeah. were. Uh, so it's good to talk to you about this stuff uh, publicly. Yeah, so, uh, man. Okay, so. And, and thanks for sprinkling in Karate Kid there because it kind of goes to that Avildsen, uh path. Absolutely. It absolutely does. So the first movie I remember seeing in the theater is The Karate Kid Part 2. I was three years old, and it blew my mind. And Rocky was always there because, you know, Rocky uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, excuse me, 1, 2, 3 were before I was born. Right. Rocky 5 when I was 2. Uh, excuse me, Rocky 4 when I was 2. But Rocky V was the first one that I remember seeing a movie poster or on the marquee, right? Yeah. yeah. So, like, I'm growing up watching Karate Kid films, um, and, and Rocky, like, the sequels, like, they're there. And as a kid, naturally, in Texas, there's, you know, back then it was, it had to be on TV or a VHS. 
at the rental store. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they'd play Karate Kid 3 religiously, like on the family <laughs> channel. And they would, they would always play, I think it was Rocky 2 on Showtime. So that's what I was like watching. Now, at the public library in Carthage, when I was a little kid, they, you know, you could go rent VHS tapes for free. So, you know, with your library card. So my grandfather would go rent the Rocky movies. They had one through four. And I remember this particular release because they had a teaser for Rocky five. So, and, you know, I'm a kid. So naturally I'm watching four, right? I'm like a little kid. Yeah, four, yeah. Is, you know, bah, 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 three. But one day he watched one with me. Whoa. I'm a little kid. I'm, I'm like seven, eight, something like that. Probably seven. Yeah. Yeah. And I got it early. I felt it. Right. Early. Right. And that had a huge impact on me. And guess what? The same grandfather was who I would watch the Karate Kid films with. Oh. Really? My Mickey. He was my Miyagi. Yeah. My grandfather. And he was showing me these films that were inspiring me. And he never did not watch it with me. Right. If I brought it to his house, it, he would watch it all the time with me. And I'll never, ever forget my grandfather. He said, I love Rocky because I like watching the underdog win. Uh, Remember, he doesn't win, as we all know, in one. Right, right. But he does win. Right. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather knew that. And he instilled that in me as a kid. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, man. Take me, take me through round 14. That is something we have a lot of things in common, um, uh, both being very handsome, by the way. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're not as beautiful as Stacey, though. I mean. Are you kidding me? I swear to God, she she's the best. I mean, that, wh why do you think she's the co-host? <laughs> I mean, people, they just adore her. Aww, they do. My, my parents love her. Sue loves her. Everybody loves Aww, Stacey. Thank right. you. <laughs> absolutely. Stacy, you could do better than Mike as a co-host. Okay? <laughs> she, she just doesn't put those emails out there, but she gets them. She gets them. So, Derek, you and I have one super major thing in common. Round fourteen is our favorite moment. What is? How's that impacted your life? What does that mean to you? Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's my favorite scene in all of cinema, hands down. <laughs> and you know, it, it means everything to me and I'm not trying to just say some broad answer it has let's talk about it from a filmmaking perspective it had and then we'll talk about from a viewer perspective like life okay sure. so from a filmmaking perspective it has all of the elements that make cinema cinema you have your hero going down the villain even though we all know Paul is not an actual villain so the antagonist mm -hmm. uh is going to win. The protagonist goes down. The mentor looking out for his kid mm -hmm. is telling him to stay down because he's protecting him. The heroine, the female love interest, the beauty, comes out, willing him, the hero, to get up. Mm -hmm. Spiritually feels that. He gets up. The antagonist sees it, is taken aback. The protagonist didn't listen to his father figure because now I'm going to get emotional because now the boy, even though Rocky was 30, mm -hmm. is now becoming a man, mm -hmm. standing on his own two feet, fighting for himself, his soul, his love, who's come out, willed him to get up because she is his equal. Mm -hmm. She is not just the girlfriend. She's equally in there with him all the way. He gets up and he fights some more. Cinematically and with Bill Conti's music and Avildsen's direction, obviously the performances, my goodness, Carl's face. It's everything you want in cinema. The close-up of, of Talia. Oh. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, from a filmmaker perspective, it's literally perfect. Right. From a fan perspective, from a viewer perspective, from life, that's why we watch movies. 
Exactly. I watched that scene over and over and over again. Same with the crane kick, by the way, <laughs> for different reasons. Same motivation, but right, right. depending on film. And that, my friends, is why round 14 is, to me, the greatest piece of cinema history because it has every element. There's not an element missing from that scene. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Do you refer back to that when you have tough times on a shoot, when you have a tough time in mm -hmm. life, has, in your personal life, whether it's with relationships, whether it's they're romantic, whether they're business, mm -hmm. paying the bills, do you ever reflect on round 14 and saying, what am I trying to, I just want to get through this goddamn day. I just want to be standing at the mm -hmm. end of the day. How am I going to get through that? I always think of Rocky round 14 when that happens to me. Absolutely. I mean, we all should just make T-shirts that say around 14. And I guarantee you, you walk yeah. in the store, people are going to know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know, you know, kind of thing. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, when I interviewed Talia for King of the Underdogs, uh, mm -hmm. she and I off camera, like she made me tear up. And really? I teared up because we were just talking about it and the impact of that scene. You know, she talks about in the documentary, which I haven't seen my film in a while, you know, you make it and you yeah. see it a thousand times and you got to let it breathe a little bit. But I, if I remember correctly, she, you know, we do break down round 14 in the documentary. Mm. Yeah. And, um, you know, she's talking about that and the way she talks about it, like she gets it as, as a, as a, as a, you know, as an outside viewer as well, like everyone gets it. So I, I'm, I'm kind of digressing here, but, uh, it, do I think about it? Yes. And, you know, you could also watch the ending of Rudy. Sure. Mm -hmm. You still get that feel. So it's like every generation, it's like the 70s had Rocky, uh, the 80s Karate Kid, the 90s Rudy for those inspirational moments. Yeah, and yeah. that's what people were drawn to. Look, no one watches. Uh, actually, I remember when I interviewed Sly for King of the Underdogs, and I asked him about round 14. He goes, ah, oh, no one ever asked me about that. They always want to talk about the final round. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was onto something because the glint in his eye. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the scene, man. Yeah, that's what it is. Scene, now, you know, want. you mentioned about Talia. One of the things I found very, very interesting, Talia Shire lived a few miles away, very close to John Avelton. Yet they rarely saw each other. What happens with that? Is that just, I mean, I guess, I guess I'm answering my own question in my head. I've left jobs before and we were close. I worked with for 10 years with people. And then, you know, Christmas parties, you know, you go see their kids grow up, grandchildren, whatever. And then you get another job and you never hear from them again. Is that kind of Hollywood too? To say that you think that's what happened there? Uh, absolutely. Because like I would go to Talia's and hang out and I'd be like, you know, you want to go see John? She's like, she said, yeah, I would love to see him. And I think they set up like a lunch and whatnot, which was great because they were like two miles away. Yeah. And, and, and so it was like, and then it'd be like, John, you know, Tally wants to see you. And he's like, oh yeah. So it, it wasn't there for the record, for the fan base, like it's, it, they loved each other. And when they right. see each other, right. it was like hugs and kisses and all that stuff. But you, you also have to remember you make a film or in their case, they made two films together. Yeah. You spend all this time together. The audience is watching that movie for the next 45 years. Yeah. They worked on it. They have other things to do. <laughs> They'll come back when, you know, for screenings or the, right. the love and admiration and friendship still there, but they have to go do other things while the audience can't grasp the separation because they're in, they're watching it for two hours all the time. Yeah, right. Um, exactly. So that, that's kind of like how it is. Like, like, for example, I just shot my feature film bloodstreams. We were okay. all together for a month, blood, sweat, and tears. <clears throat> it was amazing. And I still text and call and sometimes we'll see each other, but like we have other things to do, but the love and admiration, we'll see them at the premiere. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and and the love will always be there. So that that's really what it is. And you know, you know, you also think about it. Two miles in L.A. is like oh. two miles somewhere else. Take <laughs> right. Hours to get anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Tra traffic is a nightmare. It's a horrible nightmare. It's it's horrible. You know, you brought up something before, and and I think it's very appropriate that we we kind of just spend a second on this. Um, 
the crane kick, your opinion, mm-hmm. illegal or no? Oh, man. John and I would <laughs> And you you got to be honest too. I don't want don't you can't be a nice guy. I need yeah. an honest answer. I have yeah, two guys yeah. out front of your your home right now. If you're not honest, they're coming in. Right, right, right. I think that it was. There's a lot of mistakes in the Karate Kid film. There is. I would sit at John's house and point them out to him, and you get so frustrated. <laughs> I think How did those mistakes happen, by the way? Okay. Like, it, it, timing, lack of funds, what happens? Well, certainly in their case, not lack of funds, but, you know, pre-digital. Mm. Uh, yeah, they had playback and stuff, but it was just a different time. So you also have, you know, a script supervisor who does continuity, things like that. And sometimes they miss things. You miss things in the editing room. So I'll give you a couple examples that I point out to John. And he was just like, you're, you're a psycho. Why do you see these things? And I'll get to <laughs> answer your question. Right. So right. I said, John, did you notice the uh, fog machines in the overhead wide when Daniel's running to the fence, running from the skeleton, from the, the skeleton cobras? Yeah, go, yeah. No, I didn't. Now I do. Thanks. I was like, okay. <laughs> I said, John, did you notice that uh, Zapka loses his headband and Pat Johnson picks it up and then all of a sudden it's there again? He goes, wow. No, I didn't notice that. Anything <laughs> else? Goes, yes. John, did you notice that you crossed the line? And by the way, uh, in film world, crossing the line, what that means is you have camera positions and there's, a, there's an axis. So if you're shooting from this side and this side, if you cross that line with the camera, it flips the image to where it can throw the audience off. You never want to cross the line. You always want to shoot things from an axis point, right? Well, when Daniel raises up to do the crane, for a couple seconds, John did cross the line and shoots from a different angle. Gotcha. And he goes, Derek, 30 years later and you're pointing this shit out to me, man. No, I didn't notice that. Now I, now I noticed it. <laughs> you know, because I've seen it so many times and he walked away from it to go shoot other stuff. Sure. So, uh, but it also works. It still works. Sure. Oh my God. Of course it does. So to get to your question, I think it was a mistake. Not that he did the crane to the face. I think that the line that they say about giving the rules, that was where the mistake was. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So if that line were removed, where they're like, then the crane would be totally fine. Dramatically, it works. Dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. Just like just like that story Sly says about Kirk Douglas playing Troutman, and he walks off because dramatically it works to kill Rambo. Dramatically, but then it's like we can't have seven sequels, okay? <laughs> and we, you know, there's potential here, Kirk. You know, I'll never forget when Sly told that story. It's, it's a great story. Um, no, that, and that's happened. I remember in uh, Rocky, uh, Rocky Five, Rocky goes to Russia. His kids like seven. And he comes back in Rocky of Rocky five, right? Rocky four, he's seven, comes back eight weeks later, he, kids 15. And so I remember on, on the set of Creed two, Sly and I were out front. He was having a big stogie and I, w- we were talking about it and it was very jokingly. There was no accusatory night. It was just a lot of fun. Yeah. And so I mentioned this to him. And so he takes a big, you know, on the stogie blows the air up and he leans into me and he goes, you're thinking too much, Mike, just enjoy the movie. <laughs> I thought that's perfect. That's exactly what, what come on. It's a movie. You just want to sit back and have fun. I get it. I get exactly. It. And and you and I have talked about how you're so good. And Stacy, I'm not sure if, if you do this too, but Mike really knows every frame in mm-hmm. like what's in the background, the mm-hmm. gun, things like that. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. Things, and I would be like, uh, you know, I'd be like, well, Mike, I don't know. Like, you know, maybe you shouldn't read into it too much, you know, because I see it. I'm a filmmaker. I know that sometimes, yeah. uh, right, right, right. But I also know sometimes, like Kubrick would put Easter eggs in his films, right? Yeah. So it was why, like, I remember, uh, you know, there was a, the whole question of uh, if in part one, um, the 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 thug says, you know, you should take her to the zoo. That whole line, but then like in two, he proposes to her at a zoo. So, uh, uh. Or Ryan Rebalkin asked me asked me that. So I asked Sly and I was like, I was like, yeah, was that intentional? And Sly goes, 
I never thought about it. I just thought the zoo looked good. I didn't think about it. First it was just it just happened. I was like, exactly. Oh, okay, cool. I love that. You can't read into it all that much, but what makes it fun is when you do read into it. Yeah, and Mike, I know. I know you do. Like you, like with the gun. It, remember the gun? I was you and I talked about the gun, and yes. finally Sly told me the story on where that gun came from and why the knives were in in all over the apartment. Mm. And hearing that was like. Wow, like I have this whole concept in my mind that you know Rocky had the gun, he was given a gun because when he went to collect money, guy didn't have money, so he gave him a gun. And I told Sly that and he goes, That sounds pretty good, but that's not what it was about. <laughs> it was so simple, it was just so simple. Yeah, it, but see, that's what I love about you, Mike, is you your deep dives are so like because I guess the point is is you 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 did do a deep dive and then you got your answer. And oh, really, yes, you know oh, what yeah. I mean? And, and exa- in, in the documentary, I think in Kings, you uh, you talk. No, no, no. 40, uh, 40 years. Yeah, uh, right here. Uh, yeah, 40 years of Rocky. I th- is, it, was it 40 years where you say about the, the Ring magazine book? Or was it the, the Avelton, King of uh, Kings? One of the docs, you have it in there. You know what? I think what it is, Mike, is I, you and I have talked about that. Yeah. I think what it, I don't, I don't remember if I actually highlighted it in a doc, but I remember you and I talked about it that right. I asked Avildsen about it because yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. That's it. Yeah. Because you see it uh, early in the foreground right. in David Thayer's office. And then a few scenes later, Apollo's reading through it. So yeah. I asked John, <coughs> excuse me. I asked John Avildsen. I said, you know, was that intentional? Cause to me as a filmmaker, that's like, I love because I, I want to do that sort of thing. He goes, yeah. Yeah, right, right. Oh, we're shadowing. He said, I put it in the foreground. You see it. You don't know you see it, but you see it. Then it comes back later. So if you rewatch it, there it was, sitting on the desk or whatever. So that was totally yeah. intentional. Now, I know uh, – I love that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I You tell a great story. You've, you've told it to me, and um, I, I know – You've talked about it before. Can you just touch on a little bit about the thousand dollar story about you and Avelton? I I really love this, and and I know you've said this several times, but I'd like to have our our uh, uh, viewers hear this story. Uh, it's actually friggin' inspiring to me. Please have at it. Oh, it, absolutely. Um, and I'm open to anything and everything today. So just anything you want to know. Oh, so, oh Stacy's got Stacy's got her questions. Uh, we're we're only twenty percent in. Yeah. We're forty percent in. All right. I've got all day, so all this right, is, right. my day is dedicated to you guys. Oh, I love um, it. And, and and audience, once again, like you, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here because like Mike and I, oh. and now Stacy, we just yeah. go way back. And when you sent me that book, um, I, know, I remember. So the thousand dollar story. All right, so. 10 years ago, 2012, I had film school under my belt, uh, two feature films, acting. I was in some Hollywood stuff that, you know, I get 49 cent residual checks for. (laughs) Um, I was was hungry. I was working. I was doing it. And I was was grinding, man, like big time. I was very ambitious. I I was working on Hollywood stuff and independent stuff. But I just hadn't cracked the surface yet. So I'm 29 years old and I'm about to shoot my third feature film. And I would get on YouTube to kind of like listen to directors talk. And, you know, I remember that particular day I was like YouTubing a a Sidney Pollack interview. And then I came across a John Avildsen interview from 1988. And John, obviously, Rocky and Karate Kid, my equally two favorite films of all time. They both have the number one spot. John directed both. So he was my hero, my influence, and I studied these films for years. Here's an interview of him. So I'm studying it, and I'm getting motivation. And I look down at the username, or whatever you want to call it, on uh, the uploader on YouTube, and it says Avildsen1221. And I go... Somebody's a big Avildsen fan. And I clicked on it. And as I'm like looking through, I'm realizing this is the John Avildsen's YouTube page. He's got all the Karate Kid rehearsal footage stuff on it. And I'm like, 
whoa. And I don't know if you still can, but at that time you could send a message through YouTube. So I typed up this half business, half fan uh, message and I sent it to that YouTube account. The next day, and of course I put all my information in. The next day I get an email in my regular email from John Avildsen and it says, Yo, Derek, what can I do for you? And I'm like, now this is like huge. This is my Spielberg. Mm. Okay. So now I'm like, there's a lot you can do for me. (laughs) We start up a rapport and I'm hungry. So I offer him a script that I wrote to direct it. You know, why wouldn't I? So Mm. he goes, uh, he goes, look, I get a lot of scripts. I get a lot of people that, you know, want me to whatever. He said, I'll tell you what, send me the script and a check for $1,000. If I like the script, I'll direct it. If I don't, you have my word that for $1,000, I will script doctor every page of this script. Script doctor meaning he'll make it better. He'll fix it up. Tweak it. Give me notes. And he said, if that's worth $1,000 to you, send it. Here's my address. <laughs> no brainer. Printed the script, wrote the check, mailed it in, and kind of went on to go start shooting my feature. I get a call on an off day. I get a call from John. And I answer the phone, and he goes, Derek, John Avildsen. Get a pen and paper ready. Your script sucks. Let's talk about it. <laughs> and we were on the phone for two hours and 45 minutes. And he went over every page, every note. And he mailed it back to me with his handwritten notes, which is actually in this uh, little, whatever you call it, drawer right there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. And uh, he mailed it back to me with his handwritten notes. And so he, he didn't do the script, right? But he doctored it. He kept his word. We kept our rapport going. Uh, I was living in Shreveport, Louisiana at the time where I was in the film industry there. And I flew out like six months later to meet with him in face to face in L.A. And we meet up. We're together three hours. I offer him another script. He goes, I won't charge you this time. I haven't even made it to the hotel yet after a three hour amazing experience. And he texts me and he passed. He's like, I read 10 pages. I wasn't interested. I fly home. I'm devastated. Sure. And, but I wouldn't change that meeting for the world. Right. And then it clicks. So I call him and I go, John, if I can't make a movie with you, I want to make a movie about you. Can I do a documentary on you? And he goes, you want to work with me, kid? You're in. Let's do it. Then I moved to LA. We started making the film. I find out a year later, like a year into production, because it took us a couple years to make the film. We're sitting there, and I'll never forget. I got to set this up. He loved going to the Polo Lounge at the Beverly Hills Hotel, which is actually my favorite spot in L.A. as well. There's always celebrities there. We're sitting there, and one of my investors is in from New York, and Dr. Phil is sitting next to us. I'll never forget. And And John goes, did Derek ever tell you the $1,000 story? And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. Yeah, I go, yeah, man, best investment of my life. He goes, well, what he doesn't know is, and I'm like, he goes, I didn't mean it. I didn't know he was going to send the money. I, He just, he did it. He fell for it. And all of a sudden, I get this script in the mail with a check for $1,000. So I said, shit, I better, uh, I better follow through with my word. <laughs> That's great. I love it. I go, can I have that money back? He goes, no. <laughs> I mean, can you, come on. Like, that is wow. Amazing. And, that and is amazing. My whole life. Yeah. You know, oh best thousand dollars ever spent. Absolutely. I but love was that story. Serious. So, can you yeah. imagine? And then here he is coming through on his word. And then you become great friends with him. You share so much, uh, emotional backstory uh when watching the uh, watching the karate kid watching rocky talking about these things to me it's just um 
It's an amazing, at that point in your life, there's so much more of your life to live yet. Your life has come full circle. It's like your first full circle almost. I just thought that was so brilliant how that came through. Now, you, you're direct, you're, you're, you're editing the Rocky Ford director's cut. Two things. Hmm. First thing is, how the hell does Stallone not notice the boxing gloves are missing off Apollo's hands for all these years? <laughs> And he says in the documentary, well, I'll have to go fix that. But he leaves it in. <laughs> he, he leaves Apollo's naked hand in. And I'm like, how did he miss that? What happened? So I think, like, again, in editing, there's so many ways to make a mistake. Because you have right, hours right. and hours of footage. And back then, he's cutting it on a moviola. Like, physically, physically cutting Cutting the, the film. film strip, yeah. And then they digitized it from the master and edited it, the recut digitally. Gotcha. But he, you have to understand the amount of footage, the amount of time. Uh, like, for example, and I don't mean to interject my own self into your question, but just a couple months ago, I finished editing my feature Bloodstreams. But right before I signed off on it, I, I noticed I could see a mic pack on one of my actors backs because we hit it on the backside six months of editing i didn't catch it till i'm almost finished right, right? and that's because i was just going through examining every shot now imagine you're this huge star on a moviola i'm assuming you cut it on a moviola or yeah. something similar and it's 1985 and you've got a deadline and you just you just get it done Right. You're going to miss a few things, and your editor's going to miss a few things. Sure. Why he didn't do it in the – I don't know why he didn't fix it in the recut. But so, you know, there's a lot of – even in Rocky IV, Drago throws a punch, but when it shows the close-up of the punch hitting Apollo, it's the opposite hand. There's so many mistakes you can make because you have yeah, all of yeah. the footage, and it's just humans – Making human errors. That's all it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good thing Stacy and I never make any. Uh, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're perfect. Absolutely. My wife will tell you I'm perfect. I'm sure Stacy's husband will tell you she's perfect. <laughs> so uh, I, I have a, a couple of short questions. I'm going to turn it over to Stacy and then I'm going to uh, wrap it up with uh, one or two uh, short things. Um, when you're, you're editing the four documentary, do you giggle at all do you just giggle <laughs> oh my god I can't believe it. You... you know i couldn't i was embargoed for a year right it only john hertzfeld the director sly and i and you know a few others like the editor that's recutting it and yeah uh you know sly's wife john's wife etc literally just a handful of people knew about it so yeah. while there's all this hype about the rocky four recut coming up I'm the guy sitting here going, do, 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 do. and I'm like, Oop, can't add that. Got to cut that. Nope, that's not going in. And I'm working with Hertzfeld all day, every day, and Sylvester all day, every day. And it's like, I'm just doing this for several months, and I couldn't say anything. So I grinned a lot. And, you know, <laughs> it's hard work. You know, I'm taking all this iPhone footage and, and trying to make a coherent documentary with John's direction and, you know, Sly's input and, you know, it, it's a, it was tough, but we, we got it done. The little I know about Hertzfeld, I, I, I have always thought he's been a hell of a nice man and a, a pretty skilled director. And I know he and Sly go way back and uh, I've got just huge respect for him. I really, I think he's a great guy. Yeah. He's a wonderful guy. He's so nice. And just, uh, I got to talk to him here in a minute. Uh, when, or not in a minute, but later today, I got, I'm going to talk to him. So wonderful, sweet man. Very, very so, sweet. Rocky five, two questions on Rocky five. Then I'm going to save my last two and I'll uh, turn over to Stacy. So Rocky five, we have the theatrical cut and then we have the director's cut that most mm -hmm. people haven't seen the light of day of my question. I don't want to get into that. That's a five hour discussion I can have with you <laughs> about the, the, that cut. I am confused. Is the work print the same as the director's cut, or are they two separate? I have the work print here with a 
boatload of deleted scenes on it that Sly hasn't seen. And I, I sent him uh, shots of it. Uh, and he said he hadn't seen this since 1989. Are the, is there a director and a work print or are they the same? Well, let me ask you a question. Does yours have time code on it? It does have the time yeah. code. So I think what happened is I think two terms are talking about the same, two words are talking about the same thing. I'm okay. pretty sure the director's cut and the work print are the same thing. Okay. Um, I just say director's cut because it was, you know, Avilton did not have final cut on that film. So I feel like the work print, the director's cut, like how he would have done it. And then, you know, the studio came in and changed things up. So sure. Yeah. We know um, that. The fans know that story fairly well. Like right. He was supposed to die. Of course, then they didn't have right. through filming yeah. and all, yeah. all these things. Yeah. Yeah, so so I think that people just say directors cut and work print, but they're talking about the same thing. Okay. What you have. Yeah. Thank you. Stacy, please <laughs> get, put another voice in other than mine. I'm so sick of hearing my own voice. I'm gonna just no, no, it's great. This is great. It's funny because I have a ton of questions, but you've answered about 50% of them as we've been going. So um, but yeah, you you have big fans among our fans and I know Tony C and Tim and Karina and Brian Safard all are so excited to uh, have you on. And um, so I thought this was a great question as a like director to director, was there a specific thing during the editing process of Rocky versus Drago that as a director you absorbed and said, okay, I'm going to do this differently now, or I'm going to add that to my repertoire. That's from Tony C. Great question. Um, there's two things, uh, two parts of that, of my answer. There's a lot of things that I learned from Sly and in watching him rework his, his film. There's a lot of things I learned from Hertzfeld mm -hmm. in him directing how I edited Sly directing and editing the recut. Mm -hmm. Then I also noticed there's a lot of things that I already knew or things that I already do as a director, as an editor. So that was refreshing because it showed me that I'm on the right track and like, right. Oh yeah. Yep. 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 There wasn't anything that I disagreed with and just the way, cause Sly and I, he's given me notes a lot on, on some of my films and stuff. And I remember, you know, one time we screened the rough cut of Stallone Frank, that is with Sly. And mm. he was in my ear with the stove, just giving me notes the whole time. So, right. you, you know, you pick up these things and you, you, and whatnot. And so I'm watching it and I'm going, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Oh, that's interesting. So that's why it's a film masterclass in learning, directing, and, and editing from the man himself. Mm. Um, but also, I think a lot of people will agree that you also kind of see him doing a lot of the same things you do when you're yeah. in the editing room. And that's, it makes you feel like, um, okay, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. So, oh, absolutely. How validating. Oh, yeah. like, oh, okay. Like for example, uh, when he's just even like when he's taking the shot of Tony Burton, he's mm -hmm. going, okay, tilt it 10%, blow it up 5%, yeah. whatever he's doing. God, that's such, that's literally what all of us do all the time. We fix our shots in okay. post. So yeah. that was really cool. That's cool. And validating is like, hey, <laughs> I'm already validating doing some of the right things. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very, very. Um, and Tim is asking, and, and and I can't even imagine, like, you know, you, you grow up admiring this person your whole life, and now you're working with him. How do you keep your head Folks, how do you not go into fan mode, number one, and you're feeling like the newbie on the block? And how do you like, you know, remain in director mode when you're also a fan? I would think that's hard, at least right at first. Uh, yeah, th it is hard. You have to tell yourself you're one of them. Mm -hmm. It comes down to do you want to be a fan or do you want to be a friend? I work yeah. in this business. I don't want to be a fan. I want to be a friend. I want to be a mm -hmm. colleague or work. Right. You, you always save the fandom for later. So like, for example, um, the first time I interviewed Sly was so professional. It was, I always tell, I tell everyone, it was the best day I've ever had on set ever. Everything went so perfect. And he was so great. It was for King of the Underdogs. Mm -hmm. And 
it just was this professional accomplishment, right? Yeah. Didn't ask for a photo or an autograph. Total pro. Right. Then, like, I would run into him on the street. Hey, man, how's it going? Then I'd go to his house. Then we hang out. And then, you know, it, all these things. And that's when it's like, hey, you know, by the way, I want to ask you the question. You start doing the fan stuff. And he knows that. He knows that I'm a fan and, and all that. So, But he also respects me as a professional. And that's mm-hmm. that's the balance you have to have. Because, like, you know, you're the 100th person that day. Mm-hmm. That has, yo, rock. Right. How about be that person that doesn't do that? <laughs> right. And yeah. and whatnot. So it's it's a it's a fair balance, and um, I'm very grateful for my relationship with Sly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, um, quick quick question. I know I can't help but talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such an I'm such a horse's ass. So <laughs> you know what's funny? 15 years ago, there you probably maybe could have seen yourself standing in line at say a comic-con to meet sly or whatever going up to him in a restaurant you probably could have seen that not anymore you can't go to a comic-con and stand in line and pay the 50 dollars to get it you can't do that when you're friends with the guy that's all changed right oh absolutely and, and you and you well know i mean it's like oh yes it's 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 one of those things like Okay, do you remember four years ago when you ran into him and you were like, you know, I'm Mike Kunda, friends with Derek Wayne Johnson, and he goes, oh, yeah, we're doing a project together. Well, that's and a statue dedication. Absolutely. Yeah. Look how you guys have evolved. And, right. And, and, and so, like, that, that I remember the first time I ran into him after I interviewed him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was standing there talking to Andrew Dice Clay on the streets <laughs> of Beverly Hills. So I just walked up to Sylvester Stallone and the Dice Man. I'm like, hey, Sly, you remember me? I directed another interview. Oh, how's the movie going? Uh, hey, Dice Man. Hey, how you doing? Or that sounded all right, but whatever. And then, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, but I had a reason. Like, I had right. a reason to go talk to him because I wasn't being a fan. I was like, hey, we yeah. work together. Remember me? Yeah. So now, Mike, yeah. you're feeling that, too. It's like, oh, yes. You're, you're like, how is this happening? And, and and why is this happening? But then at the same time, you go, of course, this is happening. Yeah. Like, I deserve this. I earned this. You worked hard for this. I mean, you know, Ableton sent me a screenshot of you, uh, one of your communications with him, Mike. Did he really? Ago. Yeah, it was like a, however, an email or whatever you sent him and he showed me. Yeah. And, you know, so like. John was great to me. John was very, yeah. very nice. He he had wrote me back exactly as you said through the um, uh, the YouTube thing, and we yeah. we had gone back and forth, and I couldn't believe it. It was such a he was such a nice, generous man with his time, and uh, that that's amazing that he showed you that. Thank yeah, you for yeah, telling me. And and I remember Sly and I've talked about you and stuff. So you know, it's just you've earned it, and that's how I feel. It's like that yeah. day. Before he and I became friends, I had only worked with him for one day, but I had earned my spot to go talk to him about our project. Sure. You know. Anyway, yeah. it would digress. <laughs> no, I see. We, I, yeah, this I love digressing. Great. I do. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's like digress all day. <laughs> Stace, what do you got? What else we got? Thank you. Yeah. Um. Let's see. So, um. What do you have a favorite? Oh, I loved this question. If you were given the opportunity, um, this comes from Austin. If you were given an opportunity to direct any Rocky film, which one would it have been and why? Oh, of the existing one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, part one, hands one. down. <laughs> I think that's a given. So let, let's, let's take it further because that's a given. Let's mm-hmm. go the sequels, right? Probably... Probably five to fix it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To risk getting fired. To get it where it needs to be. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'll say. And, you know, rest in peace to my friend John Adelson. He did it the best he could. But um, five to fix it. But one for sure. But think right. about that. If anyone else other than John Adelson and Sylvester Stallone says it in my documentary, had directed 
He didn't say these exact words. Right. But it wouldn't have been what it is. Right. Guys, it wouldn't have been what it is without John Abbott. Mm -hmm. And when Sly, he actually says, he goes, I'll never, in the documentary, he goes, I couldn't have found a better director for Rock. Yep. He was yep. perfect. There wow. it is. Yeah. And of course, Sly took on the sequels and nailed it. I mean, Rocky, yeah. come on. It's right. so good. Yeah. You know, Perky Rocky, Rocky three. My God, Rocky three. You know, Sly interjects uh, some of his own life in, in a pair of yeah. boxing shorts, you know, and he j and takes it to another level. Rocky four, he becomes like galactic. He goes, yeah. you know, the universe. I mean, it really is. It, it's just, it's brilliant. It, that was a good question. Yeah, Who asked it, that one? That was Austin. Austin, Austin. asked that. He was our Austin. Marine guest. Yeah. Austin's sweetheart. Um, Karina from Romania. What is your favorite Rocky quote? Um, you know, in case I got asked this, I wanted to have like two answers because the obvious one is the whole, uh, speech when he's laying in bed the night before the fight with Adrian mm -hmm. and, you know, he's saying, uh, sometimes I get emotional, so I might not. We all do. I get this. <laughs> but, you know, I just, not another bum from the neighborhood. I can't, I'll, I'll cry if I say the whole quote. Yeah. Um, because don't we all want to prove that we're more yeah. than that? Um, yeah. in my case, I always kind of switch it up and, you know, I'm not just another country bumpkin from the sticks or whatever, you know, cause I'm sure, sure. Country boy from small town, East Texas. And it's, it just resonates. If I had an alternate though, cause I was trying to think like, okay, that's the given. Mm -hmm. Um, it probably would be. Uh, it, something that either Polly or Mickey would say, mm -hmm. I can't, I'm not going to just throw one out there, but like something, cause they always, they had really funny lines. Yes, they did. Yep. Even like the guy, you know, the bum that broke the mirror, like things like it. It's so funny. So yeah. funny. The best. The so, so, a razor. Yeah. It's just so like, uh, anyway. Okay. There's my answer. No, those are good. Those are good choices. Good options. Yeah, and I just I don't know. I I've enjoyed this so much. You, uh, I love the detail that you put in it, everything, and in the detail and the sincerity you're putting into every single answer. It's that's as you said earlier. That's why I love the Rocky community because we're all that passionate. And we love it that much, and you know, you that just oozes off you. So this has been so so fun in that way. Um, I think I just have two more and uh, Rocky.j says, do you plan, do you have any other Rocky stuff that you want to do or thinking about doing, or are you done with the Rocky stuff? Well, you know, <laughs> if I were offered something, yes, boom, I, I would not turn it down. If, right. Am I going to sit in my office where I'm at now and, create something mm -hmm. no I, I i can't um yeah mm -hmm. I, I just as we talked about in, at the beginning of the show yeah, of some right. of those presented to me absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. um you know so yeah i would love yeah. to direct a sequel or something like that but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or a prequel right or yeah or, series or any anything right. I, I think i'd be the guy to do it i yep. think you would be well, i gotta get those <laughs> offers i gotta get those offers that, yeah, that, of course. Um, and then Lorenzo Leonard, he's also a filmmaker and writer and director. And he said, hey, would you mind keep me in, keeping me in mind to audition for your next project? So he's curious, what is your next project? And what what would he do to audition of, that? Of course, I'll keep you in mind. Um, <laughs> basically, so usually I write roles for people that I already know and want to work with or know would be right for it. For mm -hmm. my last feature film, I only had one audition. Everyone else I wrote the roles for. And, uh, and that one audition, you know, you got, and now I'm putting him in other stuff because I just love working with him. So, uh, because a lot of that has to do with the fact that like, you know, we're low budget independent film. We can't just afford a casting director to go find it. I know right. I'm in the business. I know enough people I want to work with. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. for example, like 
our villain is Yuji Okamoto from Cobra Kai and Karate Kid 2. I know Yuji. I want to work with Yuji. We wrote the role for Yuji. Um, so what is my next project? Well, we're hopefully releasing Bloodstreams either this year or next year. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, a studio picture, they know ahead of time their release date, and they have all the money to do it. Us independents mm -hmm. get the distribution deal. Mm -hmm. um, we hopefully we want to turn that into a trilogy, oh. uh, trying to create a whole universe out of Bloodstreams. By the way, Bloodstreams, it sounds like a horror film. It's not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a crime drama thriller. So, uh, but yeah, Lorenzo, how would you be able to? Well, I don't know. You just hit hit me up if uh, you see that I'm going to make another movie, and we'll go from there. Awesome. He was our he was our man on the street. I yeah. can tell we we were doing these little man on the street interviews where he would go down uh, Hollywood or whatever, and he would talk to fans on the Walk of Stars yeah. and what do you think about this Rocky and that Rocky, and so and he he did a pretty good job. He's yeah. incredibly high energy, and he has a he kind of has a Milo Ventimiglia look. Mm -hmm. All right, he really does. So you know he could be. He could be every anything from like leading man to background. He could mm -hmm. do it all. So yeah, there you go, Lorenzo. We'll see what happens. We'll yeah, see what and, happens. He, and he does have a few things streaming. Um, so and, and another production coming. So he he is he was super excited when you were yeah. coming on. Yeah. Very Lorenzo's excited. a good yeah. guy. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. Hit me up, Lorenzo. All right. Awesome. Stace, any other fan questions? No, that was it. Uh, you, like I said, you answered them as we went, and those were the remaining things. So, thank you so uh, much. Yeah. All right. One of the things, um, you know, you and I had talked about, and I actually forget this because we have so many conversations. The footage that Lloyd Kaufman had and that John had was there anything of value in there that we have not seen that fans would be chomping at the bit because? We know the majority of that footage from the early Rocky, the original Rocky, was burnt, is gone. That's what they did back then. With one exception, Stan Shaw has the dipper scene. Mm -hmm. But for some crazy reason, Stan's never going to let it see the light of day. I don't understand this. Is there anything worth of value that we haven't seen yet? Okay, from the movie itself, and, and you've met Stan, and I, yeah. I've met Right, yeah, I met him at a yeah, uh, yeah. really nice man. Um, <clears throat> from the movie itself, shooting like scenes from the movie, I don't know, I don't think, other than Stan stuff, right? Um, but from the making of, from yeah. the behind the scenes, I hate to tease the audience, but you asked, yes, I do have all of Avildsen's home movies. And there are things I will never, ever, ever release because right. they're not bad. That That's not what I'm saying. Right. They're just personal. Gotcha. And, you know, I have things of Sly and his family and John and his Avildsen and his family. Right. And right. That I will never release because uh, it's just a code of honor. I'm just not sure. going to do it. However, does that stuff exist? Absolutely. Because, they lived a life. They lived lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the camera was rolling. But there's just things, again, nothing bad whatsoever. Just things. No, no, that, no. Just personal. But, but, I, but as far as like, did I leave anything out that, aside from that, that could have been seen? Yeah. Absolutely. The, the documentary is only 30 minutes. And let me tell you why. Because a lot of fans were mad about that. They uh, were. I'll, I'll, I'll clear the air. And you know the story, Mike. Yeah. So uh, I had hours and hours of, of, or have hours and hours of this footage. Uh, Sly was like, this is before he came up with the idea for 40 Years of Rocky. He was like, hey, can you put, can you ask Avildsen if you give me all of that on a Blu-ray? I just want to have it. Maybe throw some Rocky music on it underneath. And I was like, yeah. And John was like, yeah, my treat. So I put together probably two hours worth of footage. And I know I have more than that. And I put the rock, you know, Conti's music underneath in it. And it was a nice gift for Sly. He was very appreciative. He got to see things he hadn't seen in 40, at the time, 40 mm. years. So a year later, Sly pitched me the idea uh, at, at his house after watching King of the Underdogs. And um, we thought it'd be like an hour. Okay. So because it's home movies, there's no dialogue. 
There's a trick in filmmaking. If a seven-year-old can't sit and watch it, then you got a problem. You got to keep a seven-year-old attention. I cut it for an hour. It was got so redundant, so repetitive. How much can we see of him just in the ring, mm-hmm. barring with 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 Carl? So I was like, Sly, it's I don't know. He's like, try forty five. All right, because we knew we couldn't make this ninety minutes, guys. Like we knew it. Yeah. Oh my, I was bored. That's just reality. It's just footage. Mm-hmm. So I take it to forty five minutes, and it's still redundant. And now I'm terrified because I'm like, <laughs> the, the audience, they just, what Sly and I are trying to accomplish, they're going to get bored. Right. Because it's the redundancy. So I'm telling Sly this and you can see it like, even now I'm like, oh, Sly, I'm trying to figure this out. And he goes, make it 30 minutes. And if they don't like it, they don't like it. But mm-hmm. if it, if it works at 30, it works. If it doesn't work at 45 or 60, we don't want to do it. Right. Goes, Come back to me if it works at 30. Now you have to understand this. This is a man that knows filmmaking, knows storytelling. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. He know he trusts me enough that I'm like, Sly, I'm telling you, it's not working at 60 or 45. And he's like, if it doesn't work, we don't do it. If it works at 30, we do it. I cut it at 30. Boom. It's working. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, Sly, yes, now it's there's nothing redundant. And he goes, all right, let's do it. And so we did it. He did it in one take, as you know. And I had him record an an intro and an outro for me. That was the only two things that I needed from him to make sure I got. And we worked on those a couple times. But everything else, the meat of it is one take. I gave him notes the night before. As I've got my headphones on, it's on the screen. I'm listening to him. I'm watching him. I'm looking at my notes. He hit every note. Brilliant. Mark it out. So fans, that is why 40 Years of Rocky is 30 minutes. Trust me, it didn't work at 45 on. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. There it is. For the record. For the record. Mm-hmm. All right. Best advice you got from John. Best advice you got from Sly. And any advice you got from Frankie. Uh Wow. <laughs> Best of all, John, that's, that's a loaded question. Uh, he, yeah, he always said, have an opinion and stick to it. Now, he, got, he also said, now Derek, remember, I got fired a lot because of that. Yes. But he said, yeah. have your conviction. And, and he also said, learn how to work it. Work, like, in other words, stand your ground. You might get fired. If you know you're right, you're right. But he said, but have a little bit more finesse than I did and, and play the, the game. Because look, you have to think about it. A studio has all this money. They've chosen you. You have a vision. They have a vision. Yes, put your foot down. Hopefully you'll win. But he said the trick is, and Frank Capra, the great director of It's a Wonderful Life, et cetera, yeah. told him this, told me this. It's in the documentary. Make them think it's theirs. Make them think it's their idea. If you make them think your idea is their idea. Now you're going to get to do your idea and you won't get fired. <laughs> best advice from John Allison. Wow. The best advice from Sylvester. Whew, so much. <laughs> um, not that there wasn't much from John, but. Um, sorry. Uh, okay. Give me five seconds. There's so much in my brain right now. Take your time. Um, Take your time. Yeah. I can juggle. I can well, tell no, jokes. Yeah, there you go. Uh, (laughs) From a filmmaking perspective, he really just gives a lot of really good notes. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the the anecdotes to where he's like in my ear smoking a stove and he's giving me notes and stuff. I don't want to just say one thing that he's told me because there's so many inspirational Sylvester Stallone quotes out there. Mm -hmm. and advice, all this kind of stuff. Every day on Instagram, he's giving advice. Mm -hmm. So let me give a unique answer in the fact that all of the notes, advice, inspiration, things that he has said to me. I mean, he he told me one time, he he told me, he said, Derek, you have the soul of an artist. Nice. It wasn't advice, but it was very... Validation, a huge validation. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And so I'll take all of those experiences with him. Yeah. Right. And I'll just, I'll, I'll keep it here. Mm-hmm. Uh, from Frankie. Oh, Frank. Um, Frank is a, he's a bachelor, right? And right. Uh, I, I almost was married a, a couple of years ago and uh, it didn't work out and he knew her and uh, I was very upset. Mike, you met her. Yes. And, uh, it, the, the engagement fell through, right? And I'll never forget, Frank said, <laughs> he said, never give up your homestead for a woman. He goes, <laughs> he goes, never do that. You should know by now. Look at me, Derek. I'm happy <laughs> and I'm okay. And I've, he said, you never, you never give up, never up root for a woman because this is what they do. Now, Ew. clearly, guys, he's not serious. He just was trying to inspire me to kind of like, yeah, like buck up. Mm-hmm. It'll be right. fine. Right. But you know, I got relationship advice from from Frank Salone. So from the Franks was, there. From the Franks there. I'll never forget that. And he was he was trying to cheer me up. You know, Yo, nice. Frank. Frank, I I have um, Frank was uh, Stacy and I were just talking about this, and and oddly enough, this is so funny. I was we were, my wife and I were talking about Frank last night. Um, Frank really was one of the first people that I met in that inner circle during Balboa. I was just a little boy. You know that old Tom and Jerry cartoon with the big <laughs> bulldog and the little dog that's nipping at his heels all the time. Right, trying to. Get... And so I, here I am in Kensington. It's about, I don't know, five o'clock at night. Sun's going down. Sly just arrives where he's going to film the um, uh, with Lil Marie at, the, at her house there. Yeah. And um, I'm standing there with this black and white painting. And Frank is the first one to see it. And he comes right over. It was right over to me and that was my initial we just started talking and he he had filmed a lot of people don't know this frank filmed a, an entire documentary's worth of video from Bal- balboa he every day he was there D- derek will we ever see this okay, <laughs> okay. this kills me that we can't see this okay i don't think you'll be mad for me saying this but the camera that he used one day I'm at his house and he goes, it's just, it's obsolete, right? It's a little mini DV sure. camera or whatever. And he goes, Derek, like, I have so much, so much footage from, from Rocky Balboa. Like, can you get this to work? And I'm like looking at the camera and I'm like, oh, this is broken. And like, do you have the cord? Oh, I don't have the cord. It's like, Frank, I got to have the cord. I don't know where I put it. So it's like, you have the camera, the tapes and no cord. I don't know what to tell you. So he's like, all right, let me see if I can find a cord. We couldn't find a cord for it. So, like, I have held the footage in my hand and could not access it because I wanted it's, to get it for the documentary. It's got to be transferable. Those tapes can be transferable, sure. right? It's oh, yeah. Be. So he, here's the thing, and this is very, very personal to me. Frank has Sly signing my painting. He has this look of me, <laughs> and he has Sly signing it. And I'm just like, ah, I, it, not to mention, I want to see all the other stuff. I want to see right. all the behind the scenes stuff of Balboa because we all know Balboa changed not only my life, but a lot of other people. Balboa took my life and took it head first, skidding into a whole freaking other direction. I, I mean, I, it's crazy. Right. Uh, Jesus, that that's just amazing. Anyways, Frank was so kind and generous to me during the filming of Balboa uh, for, for like four days. I think I was on set inside the Victor Cafe. And upstairs, Frank was the one who talked to me for hours and hours and hours. We talked about behind the scenes stuff at Rocky Three. We talked about how he was telling me, he goes, Oh, you know, my brother's hands, he broke all his little fissures, broken fissures on the back of his hands from punching Clever Lang. He said, It really gives him a lot of, a lot of discomfort. And then Frank would sleep on this leather couch with his cowboy boots on. And Frank is the biggest snorer. I would be sitting in a chair next to him, right? And you could hear slide downstairs barking out orders and whatever it was it was amazing it was an amazing experience and frank would wake up and he goes he goes hey he goes you know what mike come on let's get out of the coffee tent and get a coffee so we get down to the coffee tent we get a coffee and we come back and he was he was Aww. very very generous to me he was so uh i always when it comes to that i i, I take my hat off to to frank oh, nice yeah all right so 
My and wolf. we, I just want to say, we just got a follow from Frank. So we were oh, very, we yeah, we got Frank. a follow about from that? Frank and I did a little dance. So How I just want to say, I was very grateful to see him follow us. So that was great. Yeah. Derek, if this kind of doesn't apply to you, and then again, I guess it can apply to you. I don't know how you want to come at this next question, but I'll leave it in your hands. <laughs> you got 30 seconds, my friend. You're in an elevator and Sylvester Stallone walks in. What do you say to him? When's our next project? Nice. <laughs> nice. You don't need 30 seconds. You got three. <laughs> Suc succinct, concise, and probably one of the reasons why Sly really likes you. Right to the point. Well, thank you. Yeah, he, oh, he's he's great. And no, th I, that's probably what I would ask him because, uh, you know, I uh, we've done four four together. You know, he's yeah. he's appeared in two, and then we've right. worked on two together. So yeah, I, I, that's what I would say because I think that you know, one time I was talking to Hertzfeld, and I don't know, we were just you know how you just talk about things. So I was like, you know what? I, oh yeah. I don't even think I have, I don't think uh, Sly, I even have an autograph from Sly. And her <laughs> goes, he's giving you more than an autograph will ever be worth, Derek. I go, yeah. I know. I know he has. And it, it's true. Like, I, I, like, I've had my elevator pitches with him. Sure. And, you know, I probably annoy the heck out of him because I just, you know, obviously I want to work with him again and, and uh, but that's what I would say. I would say, when's our next project? And I would say it with total confidence and sure. mean it. And um, hopefully something would come from it. Yeah. One of the experiences you had, I'm, I'm going to let you go in about 12 seconds. But I, I, I <laughs> just, the one the one experience you had, um, I it's it, it's it's I guess it's my personal thing. I, I've always wanted to have what's like I wanted to sit on the couch and watch rocky with him and talk about it mm -hmm. um i know that the first rocky you went through clips of it you watched it on uh, i think it was at his house you watched it I, I know you watched other things you caught the end of first blood at one point with him um to have to sit there on the couch with sly and to ask those questions for me i'm all about the the minutia there's so many minute questions i have i have a, i have a desk drawer filled with maybe 1400 questions Obviously, I'll never get a chance to ask them all to him, but there are some that just drive me absolutely crazy that I, I just I'm fixated on. Forget global warming. This is what keeps me up at night. <laughs> why did Sly? Why in, in like, OK, for this one in Rocky Balboa, why did he choose a Rambo M65 Navy military jacket? Why is Rocky wearing that? That doesn't I couldn't even understand that then. In Creed, he wears the same M65 military jacket, only it's black. Why did he choose a brown Irish tweed hat for Rocky Balboa and then go back to the Navy? I don't understand <laughs> this, Derek. It makes me nuts. I, this is not an act right now. This is the nuts that, that goes through my brain that drives Sue crazy. I don't know. <laughs> And, and, and from, I, again, I'm always telling you from behind the lens, from a filmmaker's perspective, don't read into it. <laughs> like, no, right. I, I don't accept that. I don't accept that. And here's why. <laughs> There's got to be a reason. Rocky's always in a leather jacket or sweats of some time, even a flannel pullover, something, a heavy flannel. Why an M65 military jacket? Why? Why that? Hmm. I, if, if it just... Even if it was something, okay, let me calm down. <laughs> Even if it was something as simple as that's just what his fancy was at the moment. Right. Or was that the costume designer, the set designer? Mm -hmm. Did they choose? Did they give him an option? Here's six probably, jackets. Sly. Probably an yeah. option. Because probably they would an they option. Get, and they go get everything. You know, unlike in part one, when John was like, Here's some petty cash. Go find your wardrobe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wardrobe department. They're gonna pick things out, and and he's gonna he's gonna go that way, unless he right. knows exactly for this movie I want to wear this. But to, I want to throw something at you. Did we talk about the sweatshirt, the turtleneck that he wears in Rocky Five? Ever you and I? Uh, the 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 Irish sailor one, the white one. The white Him one, John. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that comes up. Yeah, no, I don't yeah. think we did talk about that. Okay, 
So you ready for your mind to be blown? I love it. Please. <clears throat> that sweater was John Avilton's. <gasps> and John because I saw John that. wearing it. I saw wow. John wearing it in, in, in uh, other photos on set of Rocky. I saw him wear it. And John never got it back. Really? Does he still have it? I don't know. Oh. But John, John never got it back. So one day, uh, he's get, he's sending me photos That's from awesome. the set of Rocky Five to use in the doc. Yeah. yeah. And uh, no, no, we were at his house because I remember clicking. He was clicking through them. Right. And da da da. And he goes. I don't know. It got brought up, and and he goes, "Yeah, that's that's my sweater. I never got it back." <laughs> you go, what? First of all, he's like this big, and Sly's like this big. I'm like, yeah, how's yeah. it physically possible? And then, yeah, that was John Avildsen's sweater. And, so what? You know, yeah. So, like, what's what's the concept? Sly says, "John, I love that sweater." I. Rocky would have something like that. That's maybe one of the last expensive sweaters he would have taken when he sold the mansion, right? Right. When you think about it that way, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. well, Was I, that, that yeah, I have no clue how Sly wore it or why. Like, I don't yeah, know. Why Rocky? Why would Rocky have this sweater? Yeah, and why did John, like, it's literally John Allison's, like, and he just, he didn't go that far into the story, but I'll tell you another anecdote. Uh one day, he and I, John, were in Connecticut. It was really cold. And he yeah, had this yeah. big jacket on. I think I think it was like an olive green. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. And he had this big jacket on, and we're, we're doing our thing in Connecticut with the film. And I'm like, I've seen this jacket. It was driving me nuts. This was 2016. Yeah. It's driving me insane. Then I realized... There's a shot of him wearing that jacket in the documentary. He wore that while directing Rocky Five in 19, you know, uh -huh. late 89, early 90s. Really? In 26 years later, he still had it and he was still wearing it. Wow. That's crazy. How John, he was a creature of habit. He wore the same, if he liked something, he wore it. The same colors, the same clothes. That's crazy. What, I remember I was hanging with Stephen Dorff one day, and he goes, does John still wear the uh, corduroys? I go, dude, I just saw him yesterday. He was totally wearing corduroys. No. He goes, years ago, that's all he would wear. And I was I like, I told John, and he goes, that's the same, same pants. So coming back to Rocky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how that came to be, but that was John Appleton's sweater. The Italian Stallion logo. Sly creates that. Does marketing create that? Who creates that? Ooh, that's a that's a great question. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't that, know. That drives that drives me nuts. Until, yeah, because you don't see it until Rocky two, two on the back yeah. of the rope. And another thing, Rocky three, he's got all Nike products. Rocky four, he's got Adidas products. Why does he switch? Does oh. is there licensing issues? Oh, so he can charge Money. more. Mm. So he charges more money. Not I say he as in Sly as I know it's a whole production thing. So the, so they charge more money for Adidas. Why not just charge tell Nike more money? So Nike doesn't want to pay more money. Adidas will. I guess that's what it is. Yeah, that's all straight right. up product placement. Um, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, it's all like okay, we know Rocky's right. going to wear this, and you know like Boss the Boss the, you go yeah. Boss. Yep. They probably you know that's all product placement. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. You know. Literally just business, straight business. Yeah. I, I'll tell you what, I, now I'm going to be thinking of so much stuff now. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. Sly had, had, um, I never asked Sly in all of our correspondences between Instagram, email, and text messaging. I've never asked him to be on the podcast. He invited himself on. <laughs> three separate times right but it just hasn't worked out timing wise and i think eventually it will but i'm wondering maybe i should send him a text and say sly you gotta come on and let's just talk about the minutia i i mean i he said he would mm -hmm. any any tips on how to just just reach out and ask him right at this at this point just reach out and ask him well yeah i mean like you know you know another thing and he will do it, by the way. But another thing that, because uh, you know, he's not going to say it if he's not going to do it. But another thing that, like, fans were wondering about Forty Years of Rocky, they were like, "Yeah, it's coming out in the forty-fourth year." 
That's because Sly pitched it to me in 2016. Mm-hmm. We didn't record it till 2018 because of scheduling mm-hmm. and exactly. things like that. I'd, I'd seen him a thousand times, like in that, but it didn't work out until 2018. And then, of course, distribution and dealings and sure. all that stuff. It took another year and a half. But the point is, is like he he did it, you know. Right. So it right. might be two years from now, right? But he's gonna do it. Yeah, you know, or, or maybe he won't. Maybe he's right. there's so many things, but he wouldn't just say that. And uh, you know, I threw your story back to Forty Years of Rocky because, yeah, to answer your question, I had to wait as well. Yeah, and then he did it. Then he did it. Mm-hmm. So you never know. You never no, know. Oh, I know. I know. Um, it's my last question, and then I I am going to let you go because I'm sure everyone's got to use the bathroom. I <laughs> am. I know. I do. I've had two chai teas while I was sitting here. So, um, uh, at the end of the day. Are you happy with where you're at? Yeah, but and and I've you know I've told Sly this. Like, ugh, I'm happy where I'm at. I'm grateful for where I'm at, but I'm hungry still, and I'm got the fire lit, and I've got the ambition, and I'm like, and I told Sly, I was like, why am I not directing Creed, and why am I not directing even Cobra Kai? Why am I right. not? Like I'm Avilton's apprentice, and so I remember he's like grinning at me. He's like, eh, eh, maybe you will one day. You know, you know. It's like he's like, hey, in there. Like I'm hungry, so I'm. Yes, I'm happy. Not content. Okay. Now, <laughs> what, what will make me content? Uh, happy, yes, not content. Hungry. Gotcha. You just remember. I had a tiger, baby. Mm-hmm. I had a tiger. I mean, that's so true. That's so true. You just remember, Derek, when, you know, Sly had put out on Instagram about his concept of the prequel of, of early Rocky and, and meeting Mickey and, and all that. When you direct episode one or two or three, just remind me so I can come down on set and hang out. I just want to be there. I yeah. want to legally be there. Okay. I don't want to have to pretend I'm cleaning something like I did during <laughs> Balboa to sneak in. I just want to be part. I, I just want to sit in the back. Right. If you want to confer with me on my little bit of, you know, things that I know, maybe we could, <laughs> my, I'm in that neighborhood all the time in Philly. Listen, I'm your guy. You don't even have to pay me. That's how free and cheap I am. Right. You don't have to pay me. I just want to be there. That's it. Right. That's it. As long as Stacy gets to come too. Oh, of, Stacey, course. You know, too. of course. Oh, I'll this be there. Adrian factor. In this magical fairy tale world where I do get to finally do that, something like that, it'll uh, happen. We both have to be there. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Oh, it'd be, it would be wonderful, man. I, I, you know, I hope so. I hope that I get the call one day. But look, right. hey, I got the call to edit the Rocky Four doc, and I, I was just shocked, you know. So, right. like, right. who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Derek. I love you. I adore you. And I am a fan and a friend. Mm. Thank you for doing this podcast with us. I'd like to have you back on because I'd like to delve a little bit deeper into. I want to go even deeper on your thoughts on each Rocky movie. We hit huge Rocky one, Rocky five, Rocky four, but I want to come back to this. Is that okay to have you back? Well, I will come back anytime. I would love to deep dive in all of those things. There's so many things that we got to talk about. But and also I feel the same way about you. And it's just it's so great to be on your show. I've been a YouTube subscriber. I've been watching and I just it's just always you guys are so much fun. It's so good to be here and just have me back anytime. I'll, I'll, I'll beg Love you it. to come back. Let's talk. Oh, about I can't and wait. Stacy, it's wonderful to meet you virtually. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, yes, you too. Let's just do it again. Let's do it again. Mm-hmm. Derek, as our mutual best friend Rocky Balboa says, keep punching. <laughs> Take care, Derek. You too, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, buddy. Bye. Bye-bye. Boom. Oh, my God. How about that, Stace? I'm just – I that – I was not. Oh, I'm blown away. I I am telling you. I'm just like. Good guy. And I wanted to say that I'm sure he'll watch this episode, but I wanted to say to him when I watched um, King of the Underdogs, I was 
I was crying on and off of that mm. entire documentary. I just, I absolutely loved the reverence, number one, he has yeah. for Rocky and the impact that it has on all our lives. And I love the reverence that he had for John Avilton's just style. And, yeah. and, you know, they talked about how stubborn he was and, and, but you know what? He yeah. had his vision. And when he said, Avilton told him, have an opinion and stick to it, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I think he captured Avilton so beautifully and put all of his achievements into this hour and 20 minute thing. It was like, I don't know. It, it was so inspirational and it was so well done. And I just think he mimicked Avilton's style. Yeah. It, in the way he did the docu documentary, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, sure, and sure. so as moving as Avilton is in his movies, um, Derek was in the documentary. So it like complimented him with that yeah. similarity, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, very, very yeah. much. Yeah. No, 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 very, very much so. And Derek is a well thought out guy. He's not a guy you saw. Uh, yes, he was well prepared had whether it was notes or whether it was off the top of his head. Either way, he was prepared, yeah. just like we try to be prepared. <laughs> we right. try to uh, offer something a little bit more than maybe your average podcast does. And that's right. why I, I knew I really knew Derek was always going to be just like a quadruple home run. Yeah. Super Bowl, World Series, Wimbledon type of guest. Right. I knew that. And and I'm I'm really glad that I got to clear the air with fans who have been asking to have him mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. that, Derek is a, 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 my he was a go to guy for. Yeah, me. he was on the never, original list. <laughs> he was. He was. Yeah. I never wanted I didn't want to put Derek in a position where he would have to say no to me. I don't want mm -hmm. to do that to anybody mm -hmm. because I don't want to hear no. I've right. heard no about 80,000 times and I'm so <laughs> sick of hearing no. Aww. So I, I didn't want Derek to have to put him in that position so right. but it all worked out and, and we're sense. great so tony c this is to you my friend <laughs> thank you for pushing me past my little nervousness on this oh thank you tony c yeah i love tony c yeah but yeah he was oh i don't know i i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna be like thinking about this one for yeah, a long time yeah, just so too. inspirational and he's so sincere and i yeah, oh, he is. just loved him he is. loved him he loved really him. is yeah he's just a great guy Stacey, what um, else do we have to close out this epically yeah. long show? What yeah, I know got? this is a long one. Uh, what was I? I just wanted to plug um, uh, Rick Babcock. Where is he here? Did I? Ah, that? Rick. Yeah. Uh, Rocco Bob 33. I can't find it right now and I apologize. But on Instagram. Oh, here it is. The Rocky Files t-shirts. Here's our banner. And I just there wanted to go. show off the t-shirt again. Look at that. And some uh, some orders. Rick said some orders are coming in. And That's so good. Uh, Roz got hers. She sent us a little video. Nice. And Tim, Tim got his and sent a video. And so we're going to be posting all those like one long commercial. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta get one for my mom and dad because they watch the show religiously. So Aww. maybe I'll, I'll put an order in for those guys, and then I, next time I go in, I'll record mom and dad wearing them or something. Oh, say, that yes. would be kind of cool, right? Get mom and dad on here. Yes, I, I would love that. Yeah, I so I think that'd so be kind of fun. We, you guys can all go get those now. Um, so yeah, and he's doing such a nice job right out of his basement. He's amazing. I love the, Rick. Yeah, the guys, the guys, a plus. Stacy, if someone wants to find you, how can they find you? <laughs> I am at had me at yo because that's true <laughs> and the Rocky files and you were wild ones for my other men's mental health podcast called stigma does not define us. I'm on there as well. Beautiful. So you. You're looking for me. You can find me at the yo Philly Rocky film tour on Instagram and you can find me at TikTok Rocky on TikTok, but it's not T I K it's T I C K because you know, somebody else had TikTok Rocky. So, Come find us, follow us, watch us, get a t-shirt. We don't get the money. Money goes to Rick to cover expenses. Eventually, we'll put that towards something in the show, and we'll really start uh, doing some incredible, incredible stuff. Got yeah. some good ideas coming, people. Yeah. Stacy, I think it's time to go to the bathroom. What do you think? Yes, absolutely. All right. <laughs> Everybody, thanks for watching this very epic episode. Derek, thank you, my friend. We thank will you. see all of you soon. Soon. Keep. Keep. Punch it. <laughs>